Subscribe to The Honest Critique for current affairs, movie, book, and product reviews. Also, make sure you press the bell icon to get notified whenever we upload a new video. The views, information, or opinions expressed during the video series are solely those of the individuals and do not necessarily represent those of The Honest Critique and its employees. The following video contains strong language which may be offensive to some viewers. Viewer discretion advised. Hello and welcome to a very special episode we are recording today. I'm delighted to be joined by Terry Newman, who is a British-Israeli entrepreneur and investor who works exclusively throughout the Middle East. He's also a member of Yesh Atid and the World Jewish Congress. So thank you so much, sir, for taking your time and speaking to us. It's lovely to be here with you. Thank you. Before we start with the specifics to set the context, uh, if you could talk about the nature and the extent of the surprise attack launched by the Hamas and other terrorists in Gaza at the morning of October 7. So on 10-7, uh, on the morning of 10-7, uh, hundreds of Hamas terrorists attacked Israel simultaneously by land, by sea, and by air. The they had detailed uh, attack plans or with uh, details about where all the civilian populations were, all of the villages. Uh, even we're now discovering names and numbers of people in houses in specific villages. Um, very, uh, on the one hand, uh, primitive, on the other hand, sophisticated uh, attack. It caught Israel uh, by surprise. The general um, conception in Israel had been to open up to the Gaza population. Gaza has been under occupation since uh, Hamas violently overthrew the Fatah leadership in 2007. I, rem I remember, I remind you that Israel had been controlling the area until 2005. It withdrew in 2005 and handed the keys over to the Palestinian Authority. And within two years, Hamas uh, did a military uh, coup there. They threw uh, Fatah, which is the legitimate Palestinian leadership, uh, members off the roof. They beheaded them. They shot them in the streets. And all the rest of the Fatah leadership there fled. Many of them are now in the Gulf, in Abu Dhabi, in Dubai. And uh, Hamas has been ruling that area as a terrorist state, keeping uh, two million people occupied for the last 15 years. Israel has tried to remove Hamas in the past, but the overall consensus was we're not going to risk too many Israeli lives in order to do this. This is a Palestinian job. They need to get rid of Hamas. They should be risking their security forces rather than Israel risking her security forces to get rid of a Palestinian terror organization. Um, and the Iron Dome system that you've probably heard of that brings down missiles brought a sort of sense of calm that we could manage this. And so it's been managed for 15 years. And Israel in that period has come to various understandings, some more official, some less official, uh, with Qatar as an intermediary. And over the last six months to, tw to 12 months, there's actually been a lot of opening of Gaza. You know, 20 to 30,000 Gazans come into Israel every day. They work in Israel. They get their living from Israel, they go back and they work. Uh, in fact, the area that's actually been closed, ironically, was is the border with the on the Egyptian side. So Israel was in a mindset of there's not going to be major problems from here. But as you know, on the morning of 10-7, we were caught blindsided. Um, over 1,400 people, uh, you know, the vast majority of them, uh, civilians, women, children, were brutally murdered. Uh, beheaded, raped, uh, burnt alive um, in their homes. We know of over 200 that have been kidnapped and are being held hostage in Gaza, of which we know certainly up until now over 30 of them are, are babies and children. Um, there's over 3,000 that are in hospital. You know, to put this in perspective, this is about 15 times 9-11, uh, so it's a it's a huge uh, shock. But having said that, now we have to look forward. Um, 
Israel is one of the strongest countries in the world. It's got, in you know, I think Jane's rates at number eight. We're an OECD member country. We have GDP per capita of forty-two thousand uh, dollars. We are strong. We are resilient. Um, and you know, as I'm often taught, it's not how hard you get hit or how hard you fall. It's how quickly you get up. And we are getting up. We are getting up quickly. We are organizing ourselves. The first thing we will be doing is to remove any offensive capabilities that Hamas have. In the process, we will also do every possible effort to bring back our uh, hostages. Um, Israel is a society that has a very sensitive spot for all human life. And therefore, bringing back the hostages is very important for us. But also in terms of our sensitivity for human life, uh, we see what's going on with the civilian population in Gaza. They've been kept under uh, Hamas rule for 15 years. You know, there's a limit to what we can do, but we are trying to move them from uh, harm's way. Hamas purposely uses civilians, as is known, in order to uh, hide military activities. So they fire from schools, from kindergartens, from hospitals, etc. And uh, we are now in the process of, of, of hitting back and uh, we will destroy any Hamas offensive capability that they have. What action has Israel taken or planned in response to the attack, both in terms of military and civil defense measures? In the immediate uh, hours after the surprise attack on 10-7, um, what we saw was a battle that took about 24 to 48 hours to recontrol the entire area that had been overtaken by the terrorists. That mission has been done. Uh, all of the 20 plus holes that had been blown into the security fence have been closed, fixed and are now guarded. Uh, we have made every effort possible to evacuate all civilian populations from the north of Gaza uh, in order to keep them safe and out of harm's way. Um, and we have been destroying every uh, military asset that Hamas has in the northern part of Gaza at the moment. So that's where the main focus has been. We have called up 350,000 reservists, of which a large number are around the Gaza area, and a large number are on the northern border with Lebanon and Syria. Um, as I'm sure you are aware, this is not a just a Hamas attack. In effect, there is a, um, a military uh, alliance between Iran, Hezbollah, Hamas, and the Houthis in Yemen. I'd even say it's even more than a military alliance. They are, in effect, clients of the Iranian military. So, for example, yesterday, uh, the Houthis in Yemen fired missiles at a lat at southern Israel, which were intercepted and brought down, actually, by a U.S. warship. OK, so this is a currently it's a three pronged attack from uh, the very south by the Houthis in Yemen, from the center south by Hamas and from the north by Hezbollah. And we are ready. Our reservists are ready. We have called up everybody in um, the tank regiments. Uh, so there are preparations now for what will be. You know, one of the largest, it will be the largest tank uh, um, uh, war, uh, certainly since in the last 50 years in the Middle East. And we have been looking very closely as well about what's been happening between Russia and Ukraine to learn what works well, what works less well. Um, and uh, we are ready. Uh, our Air Force, which is the best uh, Air Force in terms of personnel in the world with the most experience, is been working non-stop day and night in order to uh, minimize both the risk to Israeli citizens and Palestinian citizens, whilst removing maximum possible offensive capabilities of Hamas, and also to respond to aggression from Hezbollah up north. Um, 
So those are the processes that have been uh, done so far on the military side of things. On the civilian uh, side of things, uh, civilian society has also been caught off guard. So there have been amazing civilian initiatives, of which I am part of, of one of them, which is called uh, the um, Civil Aid IL, which is a collection of the largest um, organizations we've come together and we have been providing uh, homes for over 10,000 families. We're providing over 50,000 meals a day, clothes, uh, toys, nappies, baby food. You know, hundreds of thousands of people have are now internally displaced within Israel. Um, and so dealing with that is obviously of huge importance to us. Uh, children, babies, uh, women uh, and men all need to be looked after. There's also been a huge um, mobilization, a civil mobilization of um, healthcare workers, both physical healthcare workers, but also emotional healthcare workers. Um, people are, you know, the post trauma, which people talk about, is already setting in, and that is also being dealt with. And uh, as the government responds uh, faster now, these civil society organizations can move on to the next stage of, of helping civil society. But Israel is ready. Um, I should also perhaps say one other thing about civil society, which is Israel is quite unique and different from India in the sense that because we are a small po population surrounded by enemies rather than a, uh, a 1.4 billion population, um, we do not have um an army that's made up solely of professional soldiers we are civilian soldiers so often you know you, you will be or you know i work in a certain area but when the war happens you get mobilized and called up to do something else so um the uh economy is still working uh investment is still coming into the country uh the major you know startups the high-tech world is still serving all of its clients around the world there is a lot of cooperation between Israeli high tech and Indian high tech, and we hope that that will continue. Because if there's one thing that terrorists try to do, it's to destroy civilian life. And if there's one thing that we, both as you know, modern democracies focusing on the future, need to be doing, it's needing to protect ourselves whilst also protecting civil society and allowing it to continue and thrive. I'll have the reports of anti-Semitic incidents in the UK have been influenced by the most recent events in Israel and Gaza and what specific incidents, uh, if you could refer to any one of them, uh, that have disturbed the security and peace actually for the Jews living in is uh, UK. Uh you know, many, many Jewish schools and institutions are, have now just shut because they feel that they can't protect the safety of, of the children and students inside. Uh, police required to protect all of this. And for that to be happening in one of the world's leading democracies, it is very sad, to put it mildly. Um, again, actually linking this in with uh, the world where you come from, you know, if you go back a generation or two, um, the say Pakistani immigrants into the UK, the issue that got them most uh, aggravated was Kashmir, and it was that was what drove them. The generation of the last, the last generation, actually, what you know, who are second generation British now, but of Pakistani origin, what drives them now more than anything is actually the Palestinian issue, which is actually it's it's quite strange and odd. Uh, but that's the way that's developed because of the Palestinian PR machine, which is very strong. Um, now, there are, I think, two major points that I would like to make here. Um, the first is an issue of language. Uh, you work in the media, uh, you work in uh, newspapers. Um, words have meanings and words have impact. Now, the BBC, which is the most important news uh, organization in the UK um, has made a very strange decision. And I've discussed this with the, even the people on the ground here, and they all look a bit flummoxed. But, you know, I'll, I'll put forward the issue and I'll let you and your readers decide. 
Um, Hamas is officially uh, uh, outlawed uh, and defined as a terrorist organization in the United Kingdom under United Kingdom law. The massacres that were carried out on 10, on 10 7 were, <laughs> without any shadow of a doubt, acts of terrorism carried out by uh, terrorists against innocent civilians. Yet the BBC has made a decision to call these people gunmen or militants rather than terrorists. And when I asked you know, one of the uh, leading BBC journalists here in Israel, why are you going against British government policy? Their answer was, um, we don't want to take sides. We want to be impartial. And therefore, if we call them terrorists, it's as if we are taking a side. Well, I think that at some point, the BBC needs to take some responsibility for their words, for their actions, because a lot of the anti-Semitism in the UK is caused by that. Uh, if you have an organisation that's defined as a terrorist organisation that carries out terrorist atrocities, they should be called terrorists. It's as simple as that. So that's that's the first issue. The second issue is what I call um, uh, lazy reporting or, you know, moral uh, equivalence uh, in, when it comes to uh, the uh, veracity of sources. So let's take an example. Um, at the beginning, Hamas came out with a statement saying they did not uh, attack any civilians. Israel said of course you attacked civilians. Now, because Hamas themselves videoed themselves attacking civilians, it was so bloody obvious. But, you know, they came out and said it and it was reported. So we got over that one. It wasn't such an issue. But let's take the issue of the um, hospital car park that was blown up uh, by an errant missile sent by the Islamic Jihad at Israel. OK, the BBC reported it as... Uh, Israel blows up Palestinian hospital, according to Palestinian health sources, which is the way Hamas hides behind the fact that it's a Hamas source. OK, and then it started with Israel is checking this and then it turned to Israel has denied this. And so when you are a reader, you see the event has happened. It, you know, the hospital car park has been hit. They actually called it the hospital, but we'll put that aside. That's just bad reporting. And they said, in fact, Hamas said it was Israel. Israel said it was a Palestine, Palestinian Islamic Jihad. You, the reader, go and decide. Now, how can someone living in Birmingham or someone living in Norwich or someone living in Manchester know? It's as if the, the BBC is putting the word of a terrorist organization as having the same validity as a report of an army of an OECD Western Democratic country. That's obscene. You know, and, you know, the the IDF always checks instead of responding immediately. And they checked and they had video footage on both out from Al Jazeera, uh, from Sky News and from Israeli TV footage where you see the arc of the missiles going off. Two, you see the size of the hit in the car park, um, which is uh, in line with uh, what would be a uh, missile uh, landing rather than an Israeli bomb. And three, there was uh, fuel that led to a big fire. Now, that happened because the missile blew up early, right? This doesn't happen when you have a bomb hitting. So it's as clear and as obvious as possible with all the evidence. And yet, despite that, you know, the BBC continues with this. And so we understand the impact of this. You know, President Biden was meant to have a summit with the head of the Palestinian Authority, with the King of Jordan, and with the President of Egypt in Jordan to discuss helping the Palestinians uh, on the humanitarian court. And this was cancelled because of the uproar that Israel had supposedly bombed a hospital, which Israel had never bombed. I mean, in actual fact, the uh, victims of that terror strike by Palestine, Palestinian Islamic Jihad on the hospital should be counted as innocent victims of, of, the, um, of the terrorists together with the Israeli civilians that have been attacked by the terrorists.
You know, it should be that, you know, of this, 1,400 Israelis have been murdered and another 400 Palestinians have been murdered by the Palestinian terrorists, Hamas and Islamic Jihad. So, yes, anti-Semitism is a massive problem. And the British media, specifically the BBC, has to take responsibility, A, for its use of language, and B, for making sure that it is responsible in its reporting and gives uh, uh, proper validity to proper sources. If you, do you remember the uh, Gulf War when Saddam Hussein had his minister of propaganda? And wherever he used to speak, people just used to laugh. You know, I mean, yeah, the BBC isn't doing that now. You know, if tomorrow Hamas said that uh, Israel has planned a major asteroid to come from space in order to blow up a Palestinian uh, kindergarten, the BBC will report it. Uh, um, Israel sends outer space asteroid to blow up innocent Palestinian kindergarten, according to Hamas sources. It's bonkers. And then Israel denies it. It's bonkers. That's the level that we've got to. And it's so dangerous because it will lead to people getting attacked and murdered in the UK. It has led to the cancellation of that summit that was there to help reduce the flames, reduce the violence in the area. So I think that these news outlets must take responsibility. The chairman of the BBC has to call an emergency meeting of his senior editors and they have to say we must be responsible. So what is the stance of the British political leaders and opposition parties regarding to the Israel-Hamas conflict and how it has impacted the public opinion in the UK? The British government is fully aligned with the American government, with the Israeli government, with the German government and with the French government. This was a mass terror attack on innocent civilians. And just like ISIS had to be destroyed, there was no way ISIS could be turned into a legitimate political partner the day after. ISIS had to be destroyed. Hamas must be destroyed. That is number one. Number two, as you're probably aware, the American government has sent two aircraft carriers and various warships to the area. The British government has also sent warships to the area in order to send a message. Now, what we are aware of and is in the public sphere, so I'm happy to discuss, is that Iran and Russia have an open military alliance now. Iran is one of the largest suppliers of drones to the Russian army that is used to uh, do offensive attacks on the Ukraine. Russia is currently delighted at what's going on at the moment because they think that America is being drawn into another conflict. Uh, and there are even reports, these are, I cannot substantiate or not because I haven't seen the intel, but that the Wagner Group was actually involved in training part of the Hamas operatives, that the Hamas terrorists, I should say, that carried out these uh, terrorist attacks on 10-7. We also know that uh, President Putin was in China this week. And we know that China is getting ready, certainly according to various statements made by its government, that in this decade, they will make some sort of attempt to uh, uh, attack, take over, reunify, whatever you want to call it, Taiwan, which has the uh, largest manufacturing facility of advanced semiconductors which run the vast majority of the modern world. Now, I get how does this link in with India? I remind you that uh, just, you know, a month or so ago, there was the G, was it, when was the G20 meeting in India? Was it three? September four 10. weeks ago? September 9 to 10. Um, when, when, yeah, that's right. Where President Modi and, I mean, Prime Minister Modi, sorry, and uh, President uh, Biden and MBS discussed this new economic corridor from India through the Middle East with trains which would go through, uh, you know, um, the Gulf, Abu Dhabi, Dubai, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Israel and into Europe. This was really a new world order which was being 
built in for democracies to challenge the, do you know what the, the BRIs, the Belt and Road Initiative of the Chinese government? Um, so this is was in effect the answer that the Western democratic world was coming to it, starting with India, coming through the Middle East and into Europe. That is why this attack happened now. China is trying to stop it. Russia is trying to stop it. And they have given the go ahead to Iran who have given them the go-ahead to Hamas, to Hezbollah, to the Houthis. And therefore, this moment is far bigger than an isolated attack by a terrorist group on civilians in Israel. I can tell you that neither the British government or the American government or the German or French governments would not be sending aircraft carriers, warships, significant military and civilian aid just because of a, a terrorist attack, however terrible, but is in effect a, a, a fairly small terror organization of about 50,000 people. OK, so the British government is very, very clear about this. They understand the threat. And just as we stood together during the Cold War, and I remind you that in the Cold War, whilst India at the time was actually one of the neutral countries, Israel, which had been set up the leadership, at least, had come from Eastern Europe and uh, countries that were in the uh, Soviet bloc aligned itself very strongly with America and the Western democratic world, whereas the Arab world went with the Soviet bloc. OK, we're seeing, again, Israel aligning with the Western bloc. And one of the interesting geopolitical uh, developments will be what will the Arab world do? Because the Arab world has over the last 10 to 20 years been aligning itself with the Western world. We've seen this with Abu Dhabi and Dubai, where there is a very large Indian expat population, actually, who come with the values of openness, of multiculturalism. OK, we've seen this with the changes that MBS has been doing in Saudi Arabia to improve women's rights. Obviously, it's a process. It's not perfect, but it's happening. And so, interestingly enough, we need to see in Saudi now, they are bringing on Israeli guests to be interviewed in Arabic on Saudi TV. They will not bring Hamas guests. OK, in Egypt, I remind you that only a decade ago, there was a, a, a Muslim Brotherhood government. Now, the Hamas was the Palestinian branch of the Muslim Brotherhood until it broke away and joined with the Shiites led by Iran, Hezbollah, etc. So we have a very, very both um, uh, interesting and dangerous moment. But this could be a moment where democracies stand up and say enough is enough. And we are very grateful that the Indian government and that the Indian people are with us on this, because we know that as the largest democracy in the world, any major conflagration will require working together, shoulder to shoulder, as partners, as teammates, in order to make sure that the forces of light and the forces of freedom beat all those who are trying to put them out and destroy us. So one last question that I want to ask you before I end the conversation is, how do you view uh, the role of British government, especially with the visit of Prime Minister Sunak yesterday to Israel in diffusing the conflict and trying to address the humanitarian crisis? The presence of Prime Minister Sunak here yesterday was of huge importance. And let's, I think we should split this into three different audiences. First of all, to the Israeli audience, when you have suffered a terror attack on a level that um, yeah, when we say, you know, when we say to you, you know, 1,400 murdered, 200 kidnapped and 3,000 in hospital in a country of 1.4 billion people, that doesn't mean so much. But in a country of 10 million people, everyone knows people. It's, you know, take those numbers, times them by 14, right? And you get the kind of numbers that the equivalent would be in um, in India. OK, we're talking of hundreds of thousands of people murdered in a, in an equivalent. OK, it's massive. So for him to come and say, we are with you, we stand with you shoulder to shoulder 
you know, this 80 years after the Holocaust, the Shoah is of immense importance because then nobody came to stand shoulder to shoulder with us. So first of all, towards the Israeli domestic population, it was of huge importance and we're very grateful. Secondly, it's to the British population to send a message to them. This is what the British government believes. We judge us by our actions and not by our words. We, the British government, are saying to the Israeli government and the Israeli people, we are with you. So if anybody in England wants to know what the British position is, they know. And thirdly, the message is to the outside world. It's saying to all of those terror organizations and to all of those countries who want to drag us back into darkness, who do not like an open and free world, countries like Iran, countries like Russia. And we have to see how China will respond. But I'm fearful that perhaps even China, OK, it's sending a message to them. We stand strong by our allies at moments of need. We are with them and don't try us, because if you try us, we have the resolve and we have the firepower to hit back very, very, very hard. Thank you once again for taking your time and speaking to us. It's an honor and a privilege to host you for the conversation. Thank you so much and good luck.